Gamers, welcome back to Mastering Mass Combat. Here today, I have the RPG Sage to discuss Warriors of Mars, the warfare of Barsoom in miniature. Welcome, Good morning. RPG Thanks for having Sage. me. Warriors of Mars, a 1974 rule set written by Gary Gygax and Brian Bloom, created around the same time as original Dungeons and Dragons. It was published just a few months later. Warriors of Mars is a war game intended to be played with miniatures like Chainmail. Uh, also like Chainmail, it is frustratingly complex, seeming, and incomplete compared to modern game rules. Amazingly enough, there is very little discussion of this game and how to play it available on the internet. However, we were able to find picture or two on Facebook because they did play this game at GaryCon this year. Um, we are reaching out to some of the participants and the Game Master to get a little more information about how they played and what they did, uh, but that's forthcoming and we'll probably wind up doing a follow-up video or two on this game system as it also includes aerial combat and there's another rule set similar to this it was released just afterwards. Uh, in the foreword to Warriors of Mars, Gary recommends that you read the Edgar Rice Burroughs novels to mine them for source material. Now, obviously, back in 1974, there was not a lot of supplemental source material. However, there probably was a great deal of shared cultural knowledge from these books. Uh, we did quite a bit of research and we found some other links. These will be included below in the description. But basically, uh, there are some blog articles at Swords and Stitchery, OSR Grimoire, Wayne's Books, Castalia House, uh, Iron Rationale, uh, Polyhedral Nonsense, and Tabletop Whale. You can also see an old article at the Strategic Review on archive.org. There are some random generators and a vast array of other information and his own gaming system for rules on Mars at dungeoneering.blogspot.com. So again, we'll have all those links down in the description below. Basically, the figure scale for this game is designated as 1 to 50. Distance is set at 1 inch equals 10 yards. Uh, this distance scale is consistent throughout original Dungeons and & Dragons and Chainmail as well. And the turn timing is set at one minute. There are two methods of managing play described via written orders or a move counter move format. Uh, it is in the movement trays and organization section where things get really exciting. The basing standards of this game are a little iffy. But basically, a one inch square for one human mini, a one inch by two inch stand for a green Martian infantry or for human cavalry, and then a two inch by two inch uh, base for the green Martian cavalry. The rule book then goes on to say that uh, you may mount all troops on the same size stands according to the following ratios. Uh, 10 human infantry, 5 green Martian infantry, or 5 human cavalry, or 3 green Martian cavalry. So from the given dimensions, we can infer this universal stand is 5 inches by 2 inches. It represents 500 human infantry, etc., or half of the basic combat unit of the Barsoomian army, which is called a DAR. Now, this leads to the rules on formation, pages 8 and 9 in the booklet. These have no indication of any strengths or weaknesses, nor do they seem to affect movement, other than changing from one formation to another. So once again, we have an indication that these old TSR rules are built on a set of assumptions from the existing Napoleonic gaming culture in the Twin Cities, and others, 
we're likely using the Strategos N rule set for large scale battles. Uh, part of what we're going to be able to show here is that this game is likely supposed to be played out in the form of large regimental scale battles. Uh, let's see here. Uh, for the common test battle, however, that we've been using throughout this series, the battle for the girdle of McMaximus, this will equate to 35 humans of helium infantry miniatures, eight humans of helium cavalry miniatures, and in lieu of the orcs, we're going to be using the more equally matched humans, 32 humans of Zodanga infantry, and seven humans of Zodanga cavalry. These will be skinned as orcs for the roll 20 tokens, because once again, we will be using the roll 20 screen cap uh, that the RPG Sage has been so kind and wonderful to set up for us. And uh, we're going to switch over to that screen now, and RPG Sage is going to take over and give us a little bit of a description of the pieces and the combat rules that we'll be using today. Happy to do so. So in the stock game, uh, in, in Warriors of Mars, there are four kinds of troops. There are human type infantry, which is all of the red Martians and white Martians and black Martians and all of the other kinds described by Edgar Rice Burroughs. And then there's green infantry, which are the four armed Tharks, the, the huge Martian monstrosities described. So there's human infantry and green infantry, and then there's human cavalry and green cavalry. In our evaluation of this test battle, we realized that green Martians are much stronger uh, proportionately to red Martians than orcs are to humans. Otherwise, we would have done this with all kinds of unit types and really shown off the system, but it, it doesn't quite fit. So instead, we're doing the first and second rate human cities of Helium and Zodanga to provide the, the troops. Uh, but one place we did decide to use the green Martian cavalry is in the humans, the, the Broman army heavy cavalry. Per the setup for the Battle of the Tomb of McMaximus, uh, the Orcish forces have 150 light horse and another 200 uh, medium horse. And the humans have, I believe it's 400 heavy horse. Chainmail recognizes those three grades of infantry, but Warriors of Mars does not. So we elected to compress light and medium down to human type cavalry, but allow the heavy cavalry to remain as the green cavalry. So when you look at the bases here, you're gonna see that the Orcish cavalry are all much smaller, uh, on much smaller bases than those of the human cavalry. When, armies come into conflict in Warriors of Mars, typically the first thing that's gonna happen if you're playing the game as written is you're gonna have missile fire exchanges. Anyone familiar with Edgar Rice Burroughs' Barsoom series remembers radium rifles and radium pistols. Anyone not familiar, oh man, I envy you getting the opportunity to read these for the first time. You should go and find them. They're either free on the internet or cheap and they're a fantastic planetary romance, the, the genre founders. But all of those weapons are way more powerful than what either the Broman army or the Orcish army would bring to, would be able to bring to a fight. And the setup that we were given did not include any archers or crossbowmen or anything like that. So we're gonna skip the ranged phase entirely and move directly to melee, which raised some interesting questions. In this system, there is no dicing for damage. Whether it's missile fire or melee, it is automatic damage. Anytime two units come into conflict or they, they exchange missile fire, it does an automatic fixed amount of damage. I, I say fixed amount uh, because it's always going to be roughly the same. There are some adjustments. For instance, if you are firing into soft cover such as vegetation, you do 25% less casualties. If you're firing into hard cover, you do 50% less. If you're firing at skirmishers, you do 50% less. Skirmishers in this context being anyone formed into a skirmish line or any unit in skirmish formation where their bases are one inch or more apart. But that's 
again, that's part of the discussion on formations and why you would choose to do that. Then in melee, there's modifiers for, you know, if you're charging, if the enemy is disorganized, if it's a lance charge, if the enemy is retreating, and so on. So there's some modifiers to, to melee damage, but it's always known in advance. There's no randomness in how much damage is done. And that is one of the reasons why we think this is going to be a very short battle, uh, because rules as written, the only place the dice really come in is in the man-to-man, -man, the individual combat rules, and in the testing of morale. Uh, so for that reason, we have chosen the, the troops that we did. We're going to have some human-type cavalry on the side of the orcs, some green-type cavalry on the side of the humans, and then human-type infantry everywhere. And we've also, we've also arranged for some of these figures to be mounted singly or in twos, as recommended in the rulebook to represent scouts and skirmishers. And this might even allow us to go into some of the man-to-man -man combat rules. Per the rules, per the... Mr. Yeah. Okay, I said all units do automatic damage. And in the rulebook, there is a table based on your attacker and defender, what type are they? Human infantry versus green infantry, for example, how much damage they do. But it's based on a full stand. We, we talked earlier about you know a common stand basically being five inches by two inches and containing 10 figures of human infantry or five figures of green infantry or five human cavalry or three green cavalry. And you'll see those represented on our map. Well, those are also the minimum sizes to be able to do any melee damage. Less than that, and there is nothing in the rules that says that those figures or those units are allowed to do damage. So I see a couple of ways of resolving this. Uh, one, partially damaged groups of 10 could form up to create larger groups that equal 10 or more and then be able to uh, make attacks. The second way is that you interpolate the table. You fill in the gaps in between and produce a, a modified table that allows smaller groups to do reduced damage in proportion to their reduced strength. Or the third way is to say that after a minimum size group takes any damage, that all the rest of the figures split up into man-to-man -man combat. And that's my personal least favorite. Uh, we played a sample one-on-one -on -one man to man combat here and it took six rounds of combat to determine a winner so if you're then imagining six rounds of combat with 30 combatants on each side once you've broken these units out and that'll that will quickly get out of hand and and you're no longer really representing a, a mass combat in any sort of easy way so my preference is to use an interpolated table which we have gone ahead and made. Yeah, so I'm sliding the expanded melee table into the middle of the screen here so you can take a look. And we have set it up so that it matches the table in the book for the first four lines, which is to say human type infantry, green infantry, human type cavalry, and green cavalry. So what we've done is we've broken these down into smaller groups. So the first line here, you can see 10 human type infantry will cause three hits to human infantry without a shield, two kills to human infantry with a shield, one kill upon green infantry, and one kill upon human cavalry, and then one half of a kill on the green cavalry. Uh, we've taken that down and basically split these up by half by half. So five infantry, two human infantry, one human infantry, uh, three green infantry, three green infantry, and so on. So we've got the four sections of the table here all split up so that we can dish out the damage as these units come in contact. Right. Now, I, I do want to, to reiterate, though, that this is a house rule that this is something that we have decided upon for speed and ease of play, that 
it occurs to me that the intention might have been that once you have so few figures on the board that they can't form up into a unit anymore to devolve into man-to-man -man combat. Uh, and these rules provide man-to-man -man combat examples uh, or man-to-animal or for that matter, uh, how to run a whole campaign set on Barstu. Right, and well, the the other part of that is that if these rules are really designed for much, much larger units, they can soak up more casualties according to the rules as written and then have many more opportunities to fail a morale check. Yes, and morale is a huge part of the system because units that fail morale must retreat and must spend one turn doing nothing. If in that time they are attacked again, they immediately rout and they move directly off the edge of the table and do not make attacks and do not rejoin the fight. They are out. So it looks as though this style of combat is similar to chainmail in that it, the, the the final results of each conflict are quite fast and brutal but getting to that point uh, might be a little bit of a slog depending on the size of your unit right and there's there's lots of times when you when you have to check morale there's a whole list uh, and then as we said earlier, we're using humans of Helium and humans of Zodanga. Well, why does that matter? Well, because in the rules, different cities are of different rate or quality, and they provide different rate or quality of troops. This has an impact on their man-to-man -man combat statistics and also on their morale. Uh, so, for example, uh, we have said that the, uh, the human forces here are being mapped to the Helium, uh, Nation of Helium. And so the Heliometic regulars have a steady morale of nine. And so they they roll quite well. Uh, for, whereas Zodanga, as a second rate city, uh, they would only have a morale of eight. And when we test morale, we're gonna roll two dice and try to roll underneath. This will give them, here is the morale table that shows when checks are to be made, the scores they need to roll under in order to pass their morale check, and then various bonuses and penalties. And note that if the cumulative of all bonuses and penalties brings the required morale down to two, then that unit immediately surrenders and is taken prisoner. Right, because we're rolling on 3d6. No, sorry, 2d6. Yeah, morale is two, individual combat is three dice. Yeah. Okay. All right, so here we are. This is our roll 20 screen again. And let's see here. Da, 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 da. We've gone through our casualties. All right, so let's go, let's take a look and see what happens when we uh, mash some of these units together. Okay. So we have previously determined that the Helium side represents the Roman Empire and they are in position uh, first and the orcs are represented at the top of the screen by the yellow background um, units that you see there. And do we want to just go ahead and roll a die for initiative for the uh, for the start off? Uh, sure, I'll just uh, throw a d6 here. Looks like I got a two. All right, and okay. Well, with a tied morale, I say we fall back to the rules as written. The rules as written suggest that initiative goes to attackers under various circumstances. Do you have the longer weapons, et cetera? Or all else failing, the unit which did not just move. Per the setup of this battle, the Broman army arrives a day early on the 11th 
for which reason we have allowed them to cross the river and set up. And it is on the 12th that the Orcish forces arrive. So the turn sequence then is we'll be using the move counter move system. And typically you would start with missile fire being taken simultaneously. However, we do not have any. So right now side A will move all of their infantry units first. The skirmishers are going to go ahead and move up in order to absorb charges, perhaps. So I have a feeling, let's see here, why don't we do this? Skirmishers have a range of 12 inches, so they can move quite a ways. Oh yeah. For those watching along at home, 12 inches is 12 squares on the grid that you see. So this is this arrow is of, of length 12. And do note that human type cavalry can charge when they're formed. For instance, the human type infantry has a charge distance of 15, which would put them into contact with this block of Zodangan infantry and give them a bonus on their damage for charging into melee. Right. So I think, yeah, I think what we'll do is we'll have this unit charge and then the other two units will move. These two are going to move into side-by-side -side arrangement. All right, so that will be the side A infantry. So now we'll do the side B infantry, and then we'll do side A cavalry. Well, side, side B side moves B all units, units of all types. That's right. So side B gets to move all their units, and then side A gets to move their cavalry, and then more missile fire. And then any morale checks that are made due to the missile fire, and then we'll resolve the melees. All right, so go ahead, side B. Okay, so I, in turn, want to move my folks. So I've got 12 inches of move on these skirmishers. And the first thing I want to do is move these guys into man-to-man -man contact. So maybe we can show off some of those rules. And then these guys also have some range. So... going to move him down here. Oh, you know what? I'm going to group these two together as a, as a unit of two, and we're going to do mass combat damage first, and we'll see what happens. Then I need some, need 12 inches of move, because you can't charge off a straight line, but can I get to there and then there? I think I can, because that's, if I go from the middle, right? So that's six inches and then another four. That's that's 10, that's less than 12, so I can do that. And I'm gonna ring these guys into contact over here. And bring them down to stack up and provide extra, extra ranks. Then, I've got some cavalry to charge. So these are human type cavalry who are formed. Or, well, no, at, at less than five units, they, they can't be formed. So they are skirmishing. So that means that they have a normal move of 21 inches but cannot charge. So they've got enough range, however, even, even going straight 10 and then five is still 15. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring these guys in to flank attack. Flanking is one of those tactical things which is uh, granted some, some extra damage consideration. 
and they're going to do double damage on this side as well. Lastly, I've got this big block of cavalry in the center, and I think everybody knows what's going to happen with that. I'm going to charge them. They're going to charge into contact with this block of cavalry. Because if I don't do something clever and creative with them, they are going to get charged in return, and I'd like to, to have the advantage there. Okay, so that's all of me. Now, step four, side A moves all cavalry units with mid-turn fire taken, which we don't have. Uh, however, this unit of cavalry here can charge your cavalry in the flank, I believe. Uh, because they are not a full stand of three, they are considered skirmishing, so they cannot charge, but they can move in and attack from the flank. Okay, yes, it won't be a charge, it'll just be an attack. Okay. And for everybody watching along at home and wondering what some of these leftover units are stashed in the temple or up at the top, those are uh, fill-in replacements for us in case some of these units get so damaged that they devolve into man-to-man -man combat. Can you spin this one around? I can. Boy, these guys are going to get mauled. <laughs> this is what you call interesting. All right, so there's no missile fire. And thus no morale check. And now it says all melees are resolved. So I take this to mean that we do one exchange of damage for each place where there is a melee. Correct. OK, so looking at the, the table, uh, I see that. Well, let's just let's just go left to right. I see you have some cavalry in contact with cavalry down here. Uh, my cavalry charged in. So that is uh, they are human type cavalry, five human cavalry attacking green type cavalry. So they are already only going to do one half of a casualty. But they are going to add two casualties for a mounted lance charge into the melee. So they're going to do two and a half damage. Per the rules, fractions are kind of retained until they total a whole. So the way I read this is that this stand of five charges into this stand of three. They get a they get two bonus casualties for being a mounted lance charge added to their basic half damage for two and a half damage, which would remove two of these figures and leave one at you know half health. Do you uh, agree with that assessment? I think so. Okay. Also, okay. per the rules, yeah. casualties fill in from the back. Right, and I had a question about that. Do the casual do the do they fill in during this turn, and would these get to attack, or do they? Does that happen at the end of the turn to fill in? Specifically, the rules say that casualties are removed from the back because, uh, although only the front rank fights, they are assumed to be filling in from the back to the front. So I would rule that because you have these stacked up together, as as a formation, because they didn't move, then we would remove two casualties off the back, leave basically just one uh, one figure there, and then you would also be able to do your automatic damage to me. And the attacker is three green cavalry. In response, the green cavalry, three green cavalry versus human cavalry are able to do two Casualties. Yes. No bonus casualties because you weren't the ones who charged. Correct. And
Both of these units will need to make a morale check at the end of this. Okay. Yes. So I'm going to remove that whole stand and replace it with, uh, with three individual figures to represent the damage done. All right, so now the next melee, left to right, will be at the top there, 10 versus 10. Yes, uh, and this is, my units were charged, so you get to do your damage first, I believe. And so we have five human type infantry versus human infantry with shields. Yes, please. So that will be one casualty. Okay, so I'm just going to mark them down. And then you'll fight back and it's going to be the same thing, correct? One casualty. And then here in the center, you have two skirmishers versus my one. So your two human infantry will do one half damage? Yeah, looking at our, our thing here, human infantry versus human infantry with shields will do a half a point of damage. So let's go ahead and uh, give them a red dot to indicate a half. Sounds good to me. And we have a half down here as well, don't we? Let's do that. There we go. All right. And then one human type infantry against human infantry with shield. I will not be able to do any damage to you at all. Right. That's my that's my understanding of these rules. And now for the next one. <clears throat> I'm, you know, I'm gonna move this unit one inch away because they are technically not in base contact with that other one. Or actually, rather, let's leave them there. Can you move that group of 20, one square? Yeah. Yeah, I'll do that. That way we're clear about who is and is not in combat. Right. And again, this time you did the charging, so you'll get to do five attacks. Right. So I look at the table and I see five human-type infantry against human infantry with shield. Uh, does one damage. But I get I add one casualty for being for charging into the melee. So I will do two points of damage to you. And I will receive one point. Striking a casualty from the back. And then your cavalry here, your two cavalry. That is one each, correct? Yes, I'm because they are not a full stand, I think they have to act separately. Uh, so we are going to use our expanded table and we're going to look and see that those are one human type cavalry attacking a human infantry with shield. They weren't able to charge, so it's just a regular attack. So it does half a damage, but it is the first round of a flank attack. So each one of them is going to do a full point of damage because you double the casualties for the first round of a flank attack, the first and second round of a rear attack. So they're each going to inflict a full casualty. So that'll be two more and bring these down to six. And then we have this. Green Cavalry. One yes. human cavalry versus human cavalry is a half damage with the flank attack, so that's going to double it. Into a full casualty, so that immediately reduces, removes one of these figures. And then this green cavalry is in the 
charge in, or an attack in the rear, and that would normally be one half of a casualty as well. And that'll be doubled as well. So that will also take out that loss. Yep. Well done. Okay. And that is our first turn. So now we check morale. So there are, uh, let's look at the morale table. The morale table says morale checks to be made at 25%, 50%, 75% casualties, uh, or when a unit is attacked in the flank or the rear. I think that's uh, that's the situation we're looking at here. So this unit of human cavalry, or green cavalry, I should say, at the bottom has been reduced by two thirds. That's more than 50% casualties. So they need to test morale. They are going to be, uh, we're, we're considering them as a uh, heliometic regulars. Right? Yeah. Okay, so their morale is nine. Uh, they have already suffered 50% casualties. That drops it to an eight. They are not in formation. That drops it to a seven. But that's it. So they need to roll seven or less on two dice. So we push our handy dandy button. Look at that. Okay, so they made seven. So they succeed on their morale check. Okay, now this group of human cavalry for the Zodangans needs to check their morale. They are going to be uh, red regulars. So their morale starts at eight. They have suffered two out of five, which is not quite 50%. Uh, so they just need to make a regular morale check. And they weren't hit in, in the, uh, the flanks or rear. But they are disordered. So starts at eight, goes down one to seven for disordered. Let's see if they make it. Oh no, they fail. Okay, so they must immediately retreat one full move and remain stationary for one turn. So I look at the movement table and it says that human skirmishing human cavalry has a move of 21 inches. Goodness gracious. So they need to move 21 inches, which is uh, basically to the very back end of the table. I have heard some people suggest that if a routing or retreat move requires you to uh, uh, to go off the table, then that unit is destroyed. I uh, I don't see anything like that in the rules, so we're not going to use it. But they need to immediately retreat one full move. Or I think they need to do that next round. Is that how that works? It's got to be. They failed morale and they need to move. And then they need to spend their entire turn doing nothing. Yeah, so they will retreat one full move on this turn and then remain stationary for the next turn. Okay, so they failed morale on turn one. On turn two, their movement needs to be to retreat. And then on turn three, they do nothing. And on turn four, they can re-enter play. Right, so what will happen? Well, no, they don't go off. They'll go to the edge of the table when they retreat. That's one full move, but that doesn't say they go off the table until they're routed. Routed units will move until they're off the table. So right. They move those cavalry one full move to the edge of the table. And then stop them right at the edge of the table. Okay. My question is, we are currently in step eight. Morale checks are made as necessary. Uh, and then step nine, one through eight are repeated with the rules of A and B alternating. My question is, do I move them now? Or do I simply indicate that they have failed and must move up? Uh, no, they have to move now. Okay, cool. That's, this so, is this is the last part of that's that's the last part of a morale check. When you fail your morale check, you have to move. Okay, so they immediately run away. And next turn, they turn two, they must do nothing. Turn three, they can re-enter combat. Correct. Okay. Uh, you also have a morale check to make down here. That is correct, yeah. This unit has six 
remaining. So they've taken four casualties, which is 40%. Which is not quite 50. So they don't suffer the extra penalty for being at 50%. These are heliometic regulars. So their morale starts at nine. It goes down by one because they were attacked in the flank. So that makes an eight. And I think that's it. I'm looking at some of these other things. They're still in good order because they haven't they haven't lost enough to lose an entire rank. So they're still in formation and they've taken less than 50% casualties, but they were hit in the flank. So that brings them down from nine to eight. And they weren't the attacker that round. They were attacked by me. Right. Okay. Being the attacker in a round gives you a bonus to your, your morale score. All right, so I think their morale is eight. Let's check. Wow, they made it. Okay, they made it with the, or wait, no, the 10. They failed. They failed morale. So these guys need to retreat one full move. Movement for formed human infantry is nine inches. So they are going to have to just move into the Hippo River and stop. Because they don't have enough movement to cross the water. Right. Uh, we have previously determined that the river here will count as broken ground. Formed movement no longer possible. Charge movement not possible. And rather than switch these out and make this a smaller unit, I'm going to go ahead because they're because they're routed, or no, because they're broken and retreating. I'm going to go ahead and put a yellow dot on them. All right. So we'll know that before we do any of you know, all the other moving around and stuff. So if something happens, this uh, unit will, will if they're attacked, they'll they'll be routed. So. Sounds good. And no one else has taken any wounds. So are we done with morale? We're done with morale. Start over. Now it's my turn to be side A. So that means that I start by moving uh, all of my infantry units first. So these guys up here are still in contact. So there's nothing I can do there. Um, these guys up front are in contact. I'm going to move them over. You know what? I really want to chase you, but I don't want to get attacked in the rear. So I think what I'm going to do is shift these guys over to make contact here. Let's see, one human infantry. I need my two there. So those guys have to stay there. And these guys, I think, are going to move and pivot to protect the flank. It's turn two, so this group of cavalry up here need to do nothing this turn, and next turn they can re-enter. Uh, and that's all of my infantry movement. Now it is no, your don't, turn. They don't get to turn around. They don't get to turn around. They, no, they are. They are. They have to spend one turn doing nothing. So next turn, they can spend half, spend some movement to turn around. And then oh they man, move. they're going to get charged and destroyed. They are, they are going to get charged and destroyed. Yes, sir. That is correct. So that's what's happening here. This cavalry solo will move here attack this group on the flank. Actually, no, they're going to attack this one on the flank. So if you can spin that one. Sure. Be great. <clears throat> and we 
is two green cavalry will move here and engage. And these skirmishers will spin round and attack this unit on the ground. Exciting. Okay, this guy can't move uh, because he's in combat, but these guys are free to move. Correct. Right. These two will move up here, and one will one will. Uh, they're both going to get to attack. I'm gonna I'm gonna break this up. One will be in the front, and then the second will be able to lap around the side. Okay. That will be the end of side B movement. Move units of all types. Now it would be my turn to move the rest of my units, my, my cavalry, but I don't have any cavalry who are allowed to move. Okay, now melees. So let's go left to right. Uh, you charged in a lance charge into melee. So that's going to add... So you are three green cavalry, full strength. Well, no, you just route. You well, I mean, f the first thing that has to happen is you have to do damage to determine how many you kill. So three green cavalry normally do uh, two wounds to human-type cavalry. You get to add two casualties for it being a mounted lance charge, because you had enough distance to charge, and you're in formation, and you double those casualties for it being an attack in the rear. So it's uh, normally you would do two damage, add two for four, double that for eight. So this unit doesn't route, it is destroyed. Next up, you had one that was able to move into melee combat, not a charge. But that one green cavalry per our table does does one hit to human infantry with a shield. Correct. Oh, sorry. Uh, double for it being a flank attack. Correct. Yeah, we're just, yeah, we're just gonna say that because it is a flank attack. Yeah, right, so one green cavalry, human infantry with shield, so that'll be two wounds on them. Yep. And then the heliumite, heliumitic, heliumitic? Heliumitic, there we go. They get to attack next because they're higher level than the second rate Zodangans. Yes. And that will be five human type infantry. Plus a human infantry with shield, so that'll be another wound casualty. Sorry. One casualty. All right. And then your ca your infantry will get to strike back. Excuse <coughs> me. Against the human infantry. Right. For one more one more casualty. So I'll take them down. All right. So we're gonna have a morale check here for me, but not for you. Because you're at eight of ten, which isn't twenty-five percent casualties. So let's go ahead and put a, let's put a marker on there sometime. Let's do. Ooh, is there a fun? What's what's a fun marker we can do? How about let's, uh, let's do the the green one. There we go. There we go. And then here. In the center, the Heliumites will all get to attack first. Yes. So we'll get one half damage from this solo unit here. It's from the one in the, the flank? Is one human so, type infantry yep, attacking? So be human. Doubled. 
Attacking human infantry with shield does no damage. Ah, so two times zero is zero. Okay. Yeah. And then the, however, they will get a bonus to their morale check. Right, or this, a penalty for being attacked in the flank. Right. And then this unit here is two. Right. Human infantry, which will do one half. Right. So I'll put a red dot on them to note that they got a they got a hit. Okay. And in return, my two will do another half damage and remove that guy. Which is what I had anticipated to happen. I think we're still going to get some man-to-man -man fighting out of this after all. We just might. We just might. Okay, next up we've got this big slog fest in the center. Two full strength units, five versus five, so that's going to be one hit each with no bonuses or penalties. All right, and then this over here. Uh, your, you guys have the initiative, uh, so your two human infantry will do a half damage. But it's a flank attack, so that will double. Oh, that's right. It's it yeah. is double. Keep forgetting that. All right. So they take one wound. Then two attacks from green cavalry versus human infantry with shield. That's one casualty each. Bringing me down to a total of six. So that's another morale check. All right. And I think that's it. So now we test morale. So let's uh, let's check these guys up here. Um, they need to make a morale check. They have suffered more than 25%, but less than 50%. But they were attacked in the flank. So as uh, red regulars, their morale starts at eight. They were not the attackers. Um, they're still in good order. They were attacked in the flank for minus one. So that brings it down to seven. Let's check, seven or better, or seven or worse. There we go, okay, they fail. They immediately move to the edge of the map. And must, and will next turn be destroyed, I'm sure. All right, these guys also need to test morale. Same situation, uh, they were, they are helium, or sorry, red regulars, but they were attacked in the flank and they're at uh, not quite 50% damages. So their morale is seven, let's test, they fail. So they must immediately retreat one full move, which for formed human infantry is nine inches. So let's go nine, there we go. And I'll spin them around to show their retreat and put them in position, there we go. Okay. And now I believe your two skirmishers here in the center will need to make a morale check as well. Well, we've we formed them up into a unit of two. And they, that unit of two has not yet Correct, suffered half. But, they, but they've been attacked in the flank, so that means they take a morale check. That's right. Very good. Okay, so they are I'm gonna get my table again. They are gonna be red regulars, eight attacked in flank for seven. Check, they fail. Okay, so this unit of two also retreats nine inches. Oh, good, it's the edge of the board. That makes things easy. And now all of my forces are in complete disarray. Except for the one squad, the one unit in the center. Right, so let me make a prediction about how this is gonna play out. All three of these units, whether they take any damage at all, which they will, um, they're gonna be attacked in the rear. They're gonna be attacked from multiple directions. You have enough movement here to reach any of these with any of your forces. All of those even if, routed. right, even if they are not destroyed outright as the cavalry were, they will take damage and be routed. And that's going to lead eventually to these guys in the center uh, continuing to take damage. They're probably going to get hit in the flank by those two, flank and rear, uh, by those cavalry. These skirmishes are going to form up into a, a line of 
uh, three or more and hit from the back. And these guys are either going to be destroyed outright or very quickly need to flee. They're not going to be able to flee. They're going to find themselves surrounded. Surrounded units surrender. Correct. As well, they, they'll, they will immediately be surrendered because on my next move, I can put one here. I can put one here. I can put one here. <clears throat> Right now, that that isn't technically. I, I would I would quibble about whether individual yeah. skirmishers count as surrounding, but add in the cavalry, and yeah, they're going to be surrounded. So that unit will surrender. Decisive <laughs> human victory. This is quite different from how it worked in the last battle. Very yeah. The last time we did this with uh, with war cards, the orcs were able to get into the tomb and maybe cause some mischief. And this time around, the uh, the field of battle meant that they they wouldn't have even had the chance. The second rank, the second tier troops, or do you think it was simply the fact that? The cat would did the did the. Basically, the Green Martian cavalry swing the swing the day. You know, I think it was a, mostly the the Green Martian cavalry in this case, uh, because they they are just so powerful, even singly, that uh, that they are a pretty potent force. Looking at the dice rolls, uh, only one of these was a close failure. The rest were all, you know, tens. <laughs> so we're uh, well, again, you know, heavy cavalry uh, shows its its power. On yeah, the absolutely. Well, I propose we move to the uh, the review and analysis. Excellent. Let's do so. Uh, let's see. Okay, so <clears throat> review and analysis of the Warriors of Mars. How war gamey is it? Well, I say uh, five, very wargamey, 100% wargamey. And even though there are rules in here for more of a role-playing style and individual battle campaign, uh, I would say that this is a very, very strong start to making a wargame, full wargame style role-playing game. So definitely a five in the wargamey. By contrast, I'm only going to give it a four, not because I don't think it's wargaming, because it obviously is, but because the rules are not fully developed on their own. As we said before, it seems really obvious that these are drawing on assumptions of the Minneapolis uh, wargaming societies, plural, who were doing Napoleonics and experimenting and playing with Strategos. Uh, there are there seem to be some cultural assumptions baked into these rules that are not fully fleshed out and places where, because of the small page count, there are edge cases and ambiguities that aren't fully resolved. And I'm one of those dorks who thinks that war games should have increasingly detailed rules to handle those increasing edge cases. So I'm going to penalize at one point just for over-reliance on the established culture of the time and not transmitting that forward. Okay, and so that brings us to question number two. How well would this work as a standalone war game? I'm going to give this a four for those reasons that you mentioned there. Um, I personally, I think that the war gaminess and the, and the how well it works are two different things. So I, I'm going to penalize it for those reasons you mentioned. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, how well does it work in a standalone war game? Um, I, I would actually give it a five. Uh, other than the objections that we've discussed, because it it is uh, more or less agnostic. There's there's enough gradations of troop quality and type that you can reasonably simulate almost any battle you want, and I I think we we showed that here. All right, very good, very good. How well would this system work in theater of the mind? Oof, uh, you know, my vote is like two, but not quite as bad as one. 
uh, because the troop types are so simple, because the damage modeling is so simple, um, be because the conditions, you know, flank attack, rear attack are so simple versus some complicated thing. And in its favor, because there isn't a whole lot of detail about what formations do or how to use them, I think you might, with sufficient brain power and enough caffeine, be able to hold this battle in your head. I'm going to give it a three for Theater of the Mind because for the on the player side, whereas the Game Master would be able to run this battle using sits or tokens or miniatures or however, you know, on his side of a, of a, of a Zoom or a Discord screen. And then the players on the other side would be able to uh, get a description from the DM as to what's happening and, and what's going on. Uh, I think it would work fairly well as theater of the mind. However, the caveat being that the person running the actual battle would need to be moving you know, tokens or chips or, or index cards or something around in order to keep track. That's a really, really good point that I hadn't considered. I like that. Uh, how easy is this to set up? How time consuming is it if you're going to do it in the middle of a session? Presupposing mounted based minis? Uh, effortless. All right. Yeah, I'll give this. I'll give this a five as well. Um, you know, it, yeah, exactly. Provided that you were prepared with this, you know, stack of of items ready to go, because based on what encounter tables you're going to use, I think you could, you could do it in the middle of the session, no problem. Um, how well would this integrate with Dungeons and Dragons core rules? Oof, here I'm going to hit it pretty hard because the D&D has so many different types of creatures with different attack values. Different creatures have different likelihoods of causing a hit. There's armor to consider, and absolutely none of that is represented here. Um, I think if you were willing to do a lot of legwork on the back end to figure out how various armor and two hit values translate into rate on the, the provided scale of one to 13 and use that, uh, then I think you could, you could do so, but not really well. I would say at best a three, probably a two and a half. Really? That, okay, so that's higher. I was, I was going to give it a one just because it's, real, it's only real connection is, is a superficial one to be a chain mail. And that you would have to literally write a completely, you'd have to, you'd have to integrate them yourself. And frankly, if you're going to do that, just, I would just change the names of things in Dungeons and Dragons. That's what I would do to make it easier. And you know what? Dungeons that's... and Dragons with, with different things. <laughs> because this is that... not going to be easy to integrate at all. You'd have to basically write a whole new game. Um, which takes us to our last question. How difficult would this be to integrate with open source rules? Um, on this one, I would give it a two because it would be somewhat easier to integrate the concepts with an open source system. Um, but at the same time, basically, you're just gonna you just need to reskin everything. Uh, I think the system itself has veered off in a direction away from the uh, the Dungeons and Dragons family tree uh, enough that it's so it's going to be tricky. Yep, I completely agree. All right, awesome. Well, that was another stimulating episode of Mass Mastering Mass Combat. Uh, I do want to play this again. And uh, just for those who are listening, if you made it this far, thank you very much. I believe that I'm going to go ahead and try and do an actual play uh, in the next few days but I'm going to do it using these rules and more of a regimental style with lots and lots more minis to see what happens in that situation. Uh, thank you again to the RPG Sage for joining us and making this possible. Again, I am 100% indebted to you for the Roll20. And for those of you uh, who are interested in trying this for yourselves, this will be a public Roll20 and we'll provide the link in the description below. Thanks again for having me and take care. Awesome. Have a great day, Wargamers. And please hit link, uh, link. 
Thank you again, Wargamers. Hit like and subscribe and stay tuned for our next thrilling episode.